Texas Chainsaw Massacre was a renegade movie, and you didn't know if you could trust these filmmakers. But it felt like something dangerous, it felt like something forbidden, and it did leave a mark. There was something about it that just felt like evil. It's one of those like blurry memories because I think it was so terrifying. I felt like I was paying the ultimate price which to be punished by a movie that really terrified me to my core. The way that Chainsaw makes you feel like you've seen so much more than they actually show you. Because you look at that cover, you look at the poster, you think, wow, as a diehard horror fan, will I be able to take the chaos that's going to happen on screen? What you don't see is often scarier than what you do see. And I think maybe in the case of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that was a huge factor. It was just really unlike anything else I'd ever seen up to that point, and it certainly made a massive impact on me. If this movie came out today, it would still be bold. There is one or two or maybe three movies that break the genre's back, that redefine the genre. And the world in reality, when the massacre in Texas erupted, was not ready for the massacre that came. Stop! Stop! Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. Growing up, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was one of the two films that my mom was like, no, you're not allowed to watch. You could watch anything else, but you can't watch Texas Chainsaw. When I was 12, 13, when I was trying to consume every horror movie I could find, you know, I wanted to discover horror for the first time, and it, and it felt like this completely forbidden thing that you were not supposed to watch. I had pretty good parents. They'd let me watch a lot of horror films, but there was no way they were going to let me watch something called The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I remember my older friend telling me, there's a movie called The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was a legend before I saw it, right? You know, there are certain titles and certain films, and just that title, it had the inelegance of a newspaper headline. I thought he was lying. I was like, there's no, there's no movie with that title. That sounds too extreme. By its very name, your expectations are of something really grotesque. I had in my mind an idea of what this is. It was an absolute gore fest full of chainsaws, everyone getting sliced up. It gave you the where, it gave you the what, and it gave you the how. You didn't see a lot of movie titles like that in, in the video store in early days. It was it was Night of This and, you know, spooky whatever. It was nothing like the movies that I was used to watching. I was used to creature features and total fiction, and this was so disturbing. It was reality-based. It felt like a documentary. In Germany, where I'm from, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was not R-rated or X-rated. It was forbidden, verboten. It was considered to be so deprived that it was never shown. I was doing this run of just like watching the most violent movies I could ever watch. Because like, my parents were kind of hippy dippy vegan types who um, tried to raise me without a TV. I remember I like got a, a little TV that was hidden under my bed, and every time like the house went to sleep, I'd pull it out and I'd get a VHS tape of Day of the Dead or Hellraiser and I'd put it on and I'd just be like waiting for the gore. And I was about to get into, into this section of my horror life, which was Evil Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Friends and I actually rented it one night while we were at a sleepover without anybody's parents realizing what we had done because in the 80s video stores you could just kind of get away with anything. When the guy in the, v in the VHS store would go like, okay, look around and give you the movie and, go and tell you to run. And I figured I'd seen so much horror now. I've seen Friday the 13th, I've seen Maniac, I've seen Last House on the Left even. This, what could possibly be in this film that could affect me? It wasn't like any other horror film I'd seen at that point. It was so different from the Friday the 13th movies and things that I'd seen up to that point. It had a veracity to it, although it was so artfully shot. 
it still had an element of documentary feel to it. I remember my dad had to reassure me and tell me that, you know, well, this actually took place in Wisconsin. They only called it Texas Chainsaw Massacre because it had a better ring than Wisconsin Chainsaw Massacre. But the horror of it really translated even on that really bad VHS tape. Even though it's not like bloody really, like you don't actually see anything. Give me that hammer! It rattled me so much that at the end of it, I was like, I think maybe my parents were right. Like maybe, maybe I've like fucked myself permanently. I don't actually remember the exact first time I watched Texas Chainsaw, which is embarrassing as a such a fan. I read about it, I heard the title, I was intrigued, but I did not get to see it, if you believe it or not, until I got the movie offered. That makes me a complete outsider. Actually, the first time I saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I didn't like it. I kind of wanted to forget about him because it was true. There was no fun about it. There was nothing I could just tell my friends, hey, watch this movie. It's nothing. It was just like pure, sheer uh, horror. God, it's just this woman screaming and screaming and screaming. And I'm ashamed. I, I'm ashamed to say that now. That, that was a stupid opinion. I think it is an incredibly violent film. I think my dislike of it was almost a defense mechanism. It was so different from anything I had ever seen that I think I just didn't know what to do with it. But violence and gore are two different things. The way that Toby Hooper decided to shoot the film also really highlighted sort of the, the, the tension and sort of that like waking nightmare feeling, which I think is what ultimately makes the film even scarier than, than a lot of the quote unquote gore moments. There's violence in the editing of this film. There's violence in the soundtrack of this film. I didn't really notice the first time I watched it that the violence was off screen because I imagined I saw all those things. I imagined I saw that hook go into the girl's back. It all felt so real. And whether or not you see the hook going in, you're watching a woman go on a meat hook. I think to say that that's not violence is to lose the plot a little bit. You feel a sense that the people making this movie may not be okay. It felt really stripped back and kind of like kind of like a snuff movie that, you, that you'd find on like a blank VHS tape. We loved the VHS tape because it had a very snuff film kind of quality. It, it took away a lot of the artistry of the movie. You missed what a gorgeous visual experience it is. Daniel Pearl's cinematography lends this artistic quality that you're not expecting from this type of sadistic horror. Plus in Uruguay it was called The Mad Men with the Chains, so, so it really had a title. It was, that made me I think about Letterface all the time was that madman, you know, standing outside. Here in Kansas City, we have some really epic uh, haunted houses that are open during the Halloween season, and they almost always have someone in there with a chainsaw chasing people. That is always the scariest part. It's always just dreading the chainsaw guy at the very end who would chase you out of the house <laughs> to your car. So I feel like there's just this innate sense of dread inside me when I hear the chainsaw and it's been that's been how I felt since I was 10 years old. The Texas Chainsaw like, it's so much harder to put your finger on what is so unpleasant about it and that's because it's the whole film. The way that Hooper films this he walks you right up to the line and then lets your imagination take over but in your brain you swear that you saw way more than you actually did. You take a look at a lot of these deaths and it cuts away right at a pivotal moment. But the violence is implied. Sometimes when you cut away and you hear somebody or you, you hear certain sounds, your mind makes it scarier than what you could ever give people to the eye. But you swear that you see it. And I swore that this was the most violent movie I've ever seen. No one knows what it feels like to get a chainsaw to the gut, because if it happens, you don't get to live to tell the tale. Like nobody talks about, well, that time I got my lower half cut off by a chainsaw. Nobody ever tells you that story. But everybody knows what a paper cut feels like. What did Tom Savini once say that uh, a paper cut will make you freak out more than a beheading, right? Because you can relate to a paper cut. You know what a paper cut feels like. And when Leatherface slices her finger and the story is that he really did it, like you feel that. The genius of of the hitchhiker slashing his own hand oh. at the beginning of the film. That is something that every person in the audience can identify with. And I think there's an empathetic, ugh, at the beginning of the movie that then tracks. As the violence gets worse, you see less and less, 
But because you've seen that first moment, you think you're seeing more and more. It's so gritty. There's no faces you recognize in that movie. These are all strangers. You've never heard of the people who made the movie before. There's nothing fun about it or like cute about it. Because that imagery of Marilyn as Sally at the end just soaked in blood, screaming, I think that singular image is what set the tone in terms of every, how that movie was perceived by everybody. Originality is, is, is a factor that is, is important, I think, for movies. And most of the classics, they, what they had you know, going for them, it was they the were super original at the time, right? It's true that Massacre in Texas is relatively a story sencilla. I'm one of those who think that it's not necessarily a great story, it's a great story. I think we could, you know, learn a lot from how simple of a story Texas Chainsaw is and really also the idea that it's not at all meant to be a surprise or a reveal. One thing you have to think about when you think of the story is that they tell you what's going to happen in a crawl at the beginning. So in theory, there's no surprises in this movie. You know, so often in films and in scripts, I feel like I read now, we're very concerned with like, you know, figuring out the film or like what's the big thing we reveal at the end. And, you know, not every story has to have that. Not every story that's essential. On paper, Texas Chainsaw Massacre does seem like a simple setup. You've got kids in a van traveling, and they end up at the wrong place at the wrong time. We've seen countless horror movies that do that. Que las sentimos nosotros en carne propia a través de estos personajes, de estos viajeros, y eso precisamente es lo que nos genera la sensación de peligro. There's a sense of dread from the very beginning. When these kids are in their van and they pick up the hitchhiker and, and he wants to take their picture and all, it, it's a simple story, but it's a story that had not been told before. Bunch of kids, don't think of anything bad, get off the beaten path, go through the dark forest, there's a scary house, there's somebody who wants to push them into an oven, have them for dinner. Uh, that's, that's the story of Hansel and Gretel. The difference in, you know, fairy tale like Hansel and Gretel is that there's kind of a cautionary tale to it. There's, there's a morality and usually good triumphs in the end. But here, it, evil is just allowed to still exist. She may come away alive, but so do they, for the most part. Cette simplicité, pour moi, ça fait totalement la force du film, parce que le, le fait est que le, le, le film est un, juste un fait divers, en fait, sur le papier. C'est juste une, un groupe de jeunes. It was tapping into sort of this growing fascination, I think, that was happening in America at the time, because it was right around like when we're starting to see serial killers becoming more and more prevalent, and people's concerns about that. And the suburbs were no longer safe, right? You know, it was inspired by Ed Gein, of course, but it's really far afield from the Ed Gein story. And so I remember probably about like 10 or 11, like I actually looked up Ed Gein and I was like, oh my gosh. Ed Gein, who also wore people's flesh uh, as a mask. He wore a woman's skin as a house coat. This got reported in, I think, Life magazine in maybe 1957 or 1958, and it, it did something to the psyche of this country. And that was a shock, because like, I'd heard about serial killers. Like, I grew up in Chicago, so I knew John Wayne Gacy. I think if you can give people the notion that something has some sort of nugget of veracity to it, like, that's going to make it scarier to them. And I think, again, that's why so many people had such a reaction to it, because you know, in their minds, this is pre-Google and everything, like, this is something, if it's based on this guy that everybody knows about at this point, like, oh my gosh, it could be happening, you know, next door, it could be happening two towns over. Leatherface's house looks somewhat like Ed Gein's house. His house of horrors, in that, and, and it is that Life magazine piece. They did double page spreads of just the horrible things that were in his house. I think really informed what Bob Burns did with the Texas Chainsaw House. He went all in on that. He made furniture out of bones. He made the lampshade out of human skin. It looks like he walked into a crime scene. There's just something authentic just chillingly authentic about what Bob Burns creates for the house. You know, I think one of the first of Gein's murder victims that they found was hanging and gutted from a, a meat hook in, in the back of his house. That kind of inspires the imagery of Pam being hung from the meat hook. The idea that somebody ended up in the clutches of this madman in this spooky old house 
where he had his mother's cadaver in a bedroom and he tortured them and killed them and turned them into furniture. I mean, that's all real. We've seen it sort of, based on a true story, kind of abused a little bit over the years. But I think for 1974, I think that was like a pretty bold thing for Hooper to set out to do. And again, I think that's why it was so effective. And I think that's why people showed up for it. This is a guy who is desperate to be a different person. Most horrifying of the stories that came out about Ed Gein was that he'd made a suit out of women's skin because he wanted to sort of become a woman. And I think this is something that's sort of underreported about Leatherface actually, is that he's part of a continuum of, of pop culture trying to get its head around a man who wants to be a woman. And I think it's, you know, super problematic, of course, but the idea that so many of our horror characters stem from a straight person's sort of perverted idea of transness, ultimately, I think, and you see it with Norman Bates, you see it with Leatherface, you see it with Buffalo Bill, and I think we're still getting our heads around the legacy of that. Derailing what horror films had meant until then. There's a reason they keep making movies about Ed Gein. There's a reason. Because what a fascinating subject this guy is. At a time period where that was seen as the most important thing, wanting to change your sex, wanting to be a different sex. So here's this character who is this very bullied, broken person who is lashing out on society. Robert Block did his very genteel version of the uh, Ed Gein story with Psycho, which in its day was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of 1960. A very highfalutin director decided to make a horror film that uh, went beyond what anybody else was making at that time. So in 1974, Toby Hooper was our Alfred Hitchcock. But what's happening also in 1973 is, is the news is suddenly showing you things that you didn't see five years ago on the news. You're seeing war atrocities, you're seeing people setting themselves on fire. Culturally, this is a new thing, and the news isn't sure how to deal, deal with it, and so they're showing it. And the film sort of acknowledges that with the, with the radio broadcast. There's like this apocalyptic radio uh, news broadcast happening at the beginning of this film. Health officials in San Francisco reluctantly admit they may have a cholera epidemic on their hands. It is like almost cartoonishly apocalyptic. It's all bad news. When Texas Chainsaw Massacre was done, where it took place at that time, was no man's land. It was barren, it was, uh, uh, it was <laughs> not part of the typical civilization we normally would see in movies and that we normally live in. Texas, you know, their motto is don't mess with Texas. Don't you trash that Texas highway, don't you throw it in the road, don't you mess with Texas. Don't you mess with Texas. And that it runs all the way through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Something about Texas that's really interesting that you don't necessarily see in other states is that it is really its own character. It's just so vast and desolate that I think people get lost in it and kind of swallowed by the terrain. Going down the wrong road in the rural south is just primal. It's, it's fairy tales, it's Hansel and Gretel. One of the things that was so effective about it was just that tremendous sense of isolation and the oppressive heat. And that type of isolation in itself is scary. If you really are on a road trip in the middle of nowhere and something goes wrong, you really are very far away from anything. I mean, some of those towns don't have, don't even have gas stations. So that's very real, you know, that, that, that part of the film. I've never been to the American South, so I only know it through these movies. Countryside America, countryside, you name it, any other country felt, felt, always felt the same to me. And it's, it just give you that sense of like anything goes and you're, you're helpless. You just at the mercy of whoever you encounter and, and, and who, whoever owns that piece of land where you stand in, right? There's also a culture there of isolationism. Leave us alone, you don't belong here. And that's what makes it terrified. It's like when society won't come to the rescue, you just, you know, you're just completely on your own and isolated. Right? That feeling of like, nobody's coming to help. The cavalry's not riding over the hill. Et avec des, euh, et avec donc des communautés, avec des, des habitants qui sont très éloignés les uns des autres. Et donc du coup, ça suscite beaucoup de fantasmes sur euh, justement qu'est-ce qu'il y a dans les régions reculées. If you've ever driven through Texas, you'll see like a house out in the distance and you're like, what's going on there? Because we're so used to urbanization, we're used to suburbs, we're used to everything being so close that like to live that way almost seems like, it, it just seems like the antithesis of what, you know, modern day America is. So it's kind of like going back in time and that is definitely scary for a lot of reasons. The idea of you run out of gas, you might, that might be the end of it for you. you have, you've got to go to some, um, to some shack in the middle of nowhere. You know, these, these 
these people that society has kind of forgotten, pushed to the fringes. So there's this sense of the other, like that there's something like that the people who are poor are gonna suddenly somehow come for us and tear us to pieces and eat us. And this movie plays on that prejudice so well, because it is a prejudice. There is an element of the Texas South that still wants to refight the Civil War. And there are people living in these old hundred-year-old houses who have not evolved with the times in any way. Toby Hooper lui-même le dit, moi, dès que je, sort de, enfin, dès que je sortais d'Austin, euh, je tombe sur des villages abandonnés, euh, des villes mortes, euh, ça fait peur quoi. Et il dit, moi j'ai peur de, des fois de, 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 de me perdre dans ces endroits-là quoi. He took a bunch of city kids um, and put them in an area where your education don't mean nothing here, boy, right? And gave us that sense of, you know, you make this high tower, your pretty high white tower in the city, but when you come down into the country, all that learning, ain't gonna save you. And that kind of cliche of the South as being a place that's opposed to progress and people in the South are very angry about progress, that manifests itself in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but now the characters are angry uh, about technology and they're angry that machines have made them lose their jobs at the slaughterhouse. There's something really fascinating about the landscape because I think you know, there's there's a lot of texture there in terms of sort of the wildlife and how things grow. It's like the Australian outback, you know, it's just that the, the environment becomes scary into and of itself because uh, it's just so um, hostile. Everything feels wild out there. Like, I think that's, again, it's something you see highlighted in the movie when there's a part where they want to go off and go into the swimming hole and the swimming hole there's it's been grown over that doesn't happen in everyday america but it happens in texas there's a pride of the american south particularly texas that we're better than anything anybody you know don't mess with texas don't mess with me i'll fuck you up so i think there's just something in the air in texas that makes it just have that sort of off kilter feeling that lends itself really well to this kind of a story about, you know, this chainsaw wielding madman who wants to carve up young people that just happen to be driving by. And I think that lends itself to the fear of the unknown. Nothing is scarier than what you don't know. And you can just project your imagination onto large swaths of Texas land. The shame, however, and there is a shame, there is a fallout to this is that that mentality is what kind of keeps furthering, further dividing us. There's a mentality in that that I think is a little dangerous, but as a filmmaker, sure is effective. Because the truth is, is that some of the nicest people you're ever gonna meet in your life are in those tiny little towns who will suddenly open up their doors to you and feed you. I mean, they might be feeding you, you know, the corpse of the last person who came through town. Don't eat the barbecue. Right, right. No, no barbecue. barbecue. No barbecue. Grits are fine, no barbecue. You know, a great story is always hard to create. Great characters, which usually make for a great story, is even harder. Something I learned in recent years was that Chainsaw was the first horror film about teenagers, which is something I never, you know, like, consciously realized. It gives American audiences for the first time a youthful cast and then proceeds to carve them up one at a time, which, I mean, seems so obvious now and seems so overdone now, but revolutionary in 1974. Each of them had a personality. These days, each of them has a trope. Ils sont pas en train de se dire, attends, il faut qu'il y ait le mec cool, il faut qu'il y ait la nana un peu machine, débrouillarde, il faut qu'il y ait la, la, la stupide, etc. Non, non, tu, tu sens que chacun, chaque acteur amène sa, sa touche personnelle. It is the most motley looking group of people, right? Like you've got a real, like, that is a group in that van. First time I saw it um, as, a, as a 15 year old, they all seem like, you know, sort of adults or grown up kids. Now, you know, as, as an older man, you look back and they're just kids there. And it's one of the only times you see, I think, hippies as the cannon fodder. They don't have a lot of time devoted to dialogue where they're kind of expressing who they are, but you learn just enough. I think one of the reasons that like characters like Sally and Franklin stand out is that there is a naturalism. Like, I, I think these days when you watch a horror movie and you sort of see these group of young people come together. And I don't say this because I like I dislike this, but a lot of it feels more polished. Where this is just like kids hanging out in a van, reading about astrology from a book, and like just having like these sort of nothing conversations. Where like 
These days, it's almost like you have to get sort of like these little moments of like exposition through that have to feel like relevant or these big aha moments. And there weren't any really big aha moments in any of those scenes that you see with them in the van. Like it was just a bunch of kids hanging out. And I think that's what sort of unsettled me in my adult viewing of the film is that these were just good kids going to check on their grandfather's grave. And it sucks. It sucks that, that they fall into this trap. And I do believe it's a trap. I think that somewhere in his brain, Hitchhiker knows if he digs up the bones, the relatives come, right? That's why he's got a backyard full of cars, right? It's people coming to check on these disturbed graves. There's something so existentially rattling about the fact that it's not because of their behavior. It's not because this one was being slutty or this one smoked pot. It, it, they are good kids doing a good thing for their family and they cross paths with absolute horror. You know, from then on, it's become almost most horror films are about, you know, teens to early 20s. Before that, they were about adults. And the Texas Chainsaw Massacre seemed to recognize that the audience is young people, so why don't we focus on young people? If you watch this film for the first hour, Franklin is the protagonist. To put in front of the main character, a handicapped motor, it's quite rare, especially at the time. The way people were treated at that time in wheelchairs, and especially if you're taking it with the context of people coming back from Vietnam and having, you know, to deal with losing limbs and losing their sight and things like that, and how we sort of just, just kind of threw them to the side. And you see that reflected a lot in how Franklin gets treated in this movie. Il y a un truc qui, qui est assez original, c'est que il est assez détestable en fait. All I've ever heard is that everybody hates Franklin. Franklin is so annoying. Even though Franklin is probably the most annoying person on the planet. If I were a character in the Texas States of Massacre, I would be Franklin because A, I wouldn't have gotten to begin with. I would have stayed home in an air conditioned house and watched TV. But if they, they had persuaded me to go like they persuade Franklin, because there's that moment when he's sitting in the house, he's like, oh, Franklin, we'll have a good time. Come with us. And I was like, this fucking bastard's lying to him. When they go up to the house, they just are like, oh, you're on your own, Franklin. You know, get here if you can. And then they all go upstairs and again, leave him down there. It's through Franklin we really understand how hot it is and how sticky and how uncomfortable it is. He's such a fully realized three dimensional human being and he's whining and complaining, it really helps amplify the tension in that movie because it's through Franklin we really understand how hot it is and how sticky and how uncomfortable it is. This is not the terrain for poor Franklin. They kind of forget about him. He's an afterthought. At the beginning of the movie, like, Franklin has to stop to pee, but, you know, traditional accessible bathrooms weren't a thing in the 70s. So they stop on the side of the road and he has to pee in a coffee can, of all things, and then ends up taking a tumble, which is even worse, because now you've got heat and you're probably covered in pee. And it's just like, now you're laying on the ground and everything just is awful for poor Franklin in that movie. Franklin sees that everything is wrong from the get-go. I think it's partly because he's had a hard life. And when you've had a hard life, you don't just expect that you're going to be safe. You don't just expect that everything's going to be okay. All the other kids, they're young, they're beautiful, they have athletic bodies. They have no reason to think that they could be in danger or that everything is going to go wrong. Franklin knows. There's no slasher film contract between this film and the audience yet. So anything could happen, and when it does, it kind of catches you off guard. I think empathy grows as you get older and you kind of see things a little differently. But now I feel for him because it's like, there's nowhere for him to go. The template of the final girl started with Psycho, even though she dies <laughs> first. Marilyn Burns is the ultimate final girl. She's the first to my understanding that, you know, to be final girl, you need to survive and escape the film. One of my favorite things about Sally is her will to survive. There's always a point in the movie where I actually think to myself, I would have just run into the chainsaw, why bother? The idea of the female protagonist or a female protagonist in a genre, in a, not just a genre, but a industry that is dominated by male action stars was a very, very important change that came. For me, a final girl, she's very proactive. She's very in the moment. And I think for me, more so than anything, I think I think Sally Hardesty is a survivor. You know, they talk about final girls in the slasher film genre and whatnot, but I don't think Marilyn Burns has so much as a close-up in the first hour of the film. She's a final girl through attrition. I don't know that she's necessarily super, you know, 
active in her own, you know, doing something to ensure her survival. I think she's just like, I have this very quick moment where I can get out of here and I'm just gonna run. And Texas Chainsaw Massacre, having a female protagonist that makes it through all three acts, kind of gilded that. The psychology that a woman gets to transcend from a pixie, from the underdog, into a full-fledged action hero, almost a male character. Also, you could call her the ultimate scream queen because the amount of screams she does in the film, they're like, gut-wrenching, like you can feel them within you. As a woman, I can relate to her not being a damsel in distress and not having to be rescued by the guy. But everything that she does seems real. It doesn't feel superhuman. It doesn't feel like, oh, I, you know, yes, I can fly through the window and do all that other stuff. She gets a shit beat out of her. They can relate to that person in her pain in her oppression, but also in her transformation into a strong, emancipated character. In a lot of ways, I think Texas Chains is almost like this very reactionary movie where like everybody's just sort of reacting to the moment of everything. This is not, I'm gonna fight you and come out on top. She is constantly trying to outlast. She's, she's never trying to undo her, her ropes. She's just like, oh my God, I'm in this like nightmare. How am I going to get out? It's an endurance test. She proves what an endurance test that, that horror can be, especially for a survivor. But she doesn't jump through one window. She jumps through two windows. She wants to keep going. She's like Jackie Chan by the end of that movie, the amount of like physical abuse she's gone through and still been able to make it to that truck and get away. She gets away. I mean, her brain cracks while she's while she's on her way out, but she gets away because of her own ingenuity and strength. Well, I'm I'm sorry. How many movies were being made at that time period that were showing the strength and ingenuity of women like that, especially young women, young blonde, pretty women? You know, I feel like she went through a lot with the, for this film. We kind of we've heard the background and how it was not exactly fair to her in many moments. And kind of like her real terror is captured in this film. There is a reason why final boys don't really exist. I think I really loved horror movies because I identified with those women because they were allowed to have feelings, which I had. But men in movies you weren't allowed to see having feelings. So I think that, yeah, I think, I think it, she had to be a woman, not because women are more vulnerable and women scream more and they're more afraid, but because in a movie nobody will allow a man to be like that. There is a want to protect that person on screen. Right? So if there's some big husky guy, you're not as like, oh my God, I want to save him. People just don't, brains don't work that way. But if we see a woman going through that, we are kind of, we jump to that, right? Just psychologically, we just jump to it. It's very hard to, to kind of find a performance from a guy in a horror movie as visceral and as authentic as, as Marilyn. Because she is a lion. She is not a lamb. She is not led to slaughter. She is the one they shouldn't have trapped. She's the one who outsmarts them all and, and, and beats them. And it really kind of makes you want to see her get to the other side, even though it's questionable what that other side is gonna be. I've been developing kind of monster movies and slasher movies and all these, all these, um, these horror movies where you need a really uh, striking villain and all, you know, all the way through the through the development process, you're always throwing around this word like it's got to be iconic. It's got to be something that people are going to want to have on their T-shirt 20 years later, and all these kind of things you throw around. And it's really fucking hard to um, to come up with something iconic. And the fact that Toby Hooper like basically made a whole family of iconic characters. I think the word family is really important here. We have to remember that in the 70s, the face of the family was changing greatly, just from even the decade before. People were um, living together before getting married, divorce rates were moving up, and there was a lot of tension around that. What's interesting about the Sawyer family is that they are the Norman Rockwell American family painted in red. What's interesting is that Toby Hooper describes a family that is completely dysfunctional. How we get to know the family and see them interact is like one of the most unique things about Chainsaw, especially if you compare it to any slasher. The relationship is like a real American family, but it's gone to hell. They have excessive personalities. They have very distinctive personalities. And they're all kind of scary in their own way. You know, Hitchhiker presents a totally different threat than the cook does, and cook's very, very different to Leatherface. There's something about the levels that the different family members are operating on. You totally kind of understand 
that dynamic as fucked up as it is. They relate to each other as a family would. Uh, there's a wayward child. The hitchhiker will get in your van and maybe carry on a conversation, but very quickly you realize that there's something wrong with this guy. The rebellious nitwit who thinks he's doing good things and he's so proud when he brings home his roadkill. You don't know the extent of his madness. You don't know the depth of his uh, abilities, right? In terms of is he going to be dangerous or not? And that van ride is a perfect, perfect first course in this film of like, we are in trouble and gives you a sense of how ill-equipped these people are to navigate even the slightest danger. C'est-à-dire euh, avec l'autostoppeur. Mm -hmm. Et en fait, euh, moi, je me rappelle que ça m'avait vraiment fait peur. C'est-à-dire que quand il monte dans le van, t'as en, envie qu'il soit gentil, tu dis, ah ben non, mais c'est bon, il lui rend service. Oui, et moi, il, il m'avait fait mes peur et quand il s'ouvre la main d'un coup, et j'avais vraiment pas vu venir le truc, ça rejoint ce que je disais sur le côté de je savais pas à quoi m'attendre dans la scène d'après. The first thing that hits me hard is when the hitchhiker cuts him. That is a powerful moment and you know that you're in for a ride and you're not sure that you want to go on that ride. And this hitchhiker is so believably frightening and, you know, feels like an innocent himself. And you believe that he's an innocent to a certain point, but once he takes the picture and asks for five dollars, it's a good picture. You know, it's like, oh, this is getting scary. But when he actually cuts and draws blood, all bets are off. You don't know what these renegade filmmakers are capable of, and you don't know what you're going to see and if you can take what you're going to see. I'm stealing this quote from Trevor Henderson, who designed Siren Head. He said, the scariest creatures or the scariest creations are the ones that teeter on being silly. Your first instinct is like maybe, is maybe to laugh or to smirk. All of the Sawyer family in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they're dialed up to that point of ridiculousness, where if it wasn't so horrifying and so kind of claustrophobic, and in another setting, they'd be, they'd be a freak show. Well, the original family, to tell you the truth, was my least favorite part of the movie. It was almost a disconnect, it seemed too zany. It made me not feel like I was really there. I wasn't inside his head any longer, or it wasn't that one-shooter perspective, visceral experience anymore. I felt like I'm looking now from the outside, inside the goldfish bowl. And, 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 and to me, when that happens, I become aware of the fact that I'm watching a movie. The cook is fascinating because he's a functioning member of society. He has a functioning job that fits right in with the town. He warns the kids, you don't want to go there. To me, what he represents is that whatever stranger you're interacting with in an unfamiliar place, you don't know what's behind that person. And you don't know if that person is uh, bad news or not necessarily which certainly ties into the 70s serial killer of it all because those guys moved freely through society and, and would, you know, got away with what they did because people trusted them, right? So the cook is really a great type in terms of that for me. He's, he's a guy that you have no reason to mistrust. And that's why, even though we've all seen this um, so many times, that that turn that the cook takes is so perfect. And the way he plays it off is just so genius because it's so understanding. He's like, well, we're just, you know, just don't fight and we're just gonna do this. And it's like we're, in most horror movies, like the villain characters are always sort of, like they're overstated in, in sort of their their approach where they're like, ha ha, now I'm going to take you. And he's just like, yeah, I've got this sack and I've got this rope and we're, I'm gonna take you back to the house now and that's gonna be okay. And the cook is like kind of the, he's sort of taken over for the father, I, I guess, the abusive father because he's terribly abusive. You know, child abuse, again, wasn't something that was really being dealt with in America until the 1970s. It was just something that sort of happened in people's homes. That was their business and nobody was supposed to care. And you see the product of that in the form of these other characters. Most of the classic horror icons like, you know, like Myers and Jason and Freddie, they, they all came later, right? And they all came all inspired by, by Letterface, for sure. He was the first kind of the the man with the mask figure, you know, that was created in a horror film. He was, you know, he was the first time you saw a Hulkin figure that had a mask and, and, and used power tools. The mask is really scary and it kind of has its own personality in a way, but it's also blank. And when you're looking at something blank, that is terrifying. You're able to project your own fears into it. En tant que spectateur, euh, de par le titre, on s'attend vraiment à ce que ce soit euh, un monstre euh, 
inarrêtable, sanguinaire, et en fait, on se rend compte que c'est un espèce d'enfant coincé dans un, un corps d'adulte. He is the strongest and most powerful character in the film and the most scary and also the most frightened. And so what Leatherface does is he allows us to tap into these kind of darkest ideas that we have inside of ourselves and then sort of project them or release them. I was bullied when I was a kid in school. I can relate to somebody who flips a lid. And uh, even though I never did, the fact that somebody's living out these tribal, primal animal instincts within me is somewhat liberating. The magic of the original Leatherface is his unpredictability. It's almost like the shark from Jaws, you know, there's just no reasoning with him. He's just this pure wall of insanity that you're never going to crash through. When he shows up, it's, there's no telegraphing Leatherface, there's no shadowy anything, and he, he shows up fully formed for the first time, and he's doing his thing. He's jarring, he's unpredictable, he's unknowable. You just see this big hulking guy you know, with either a mallet or a chainsaw, and he's just inflicting pain, right? That's that's what his, his function in that story is. Leatherface doesn't even have a name. You know, Leatherface is just unstoppable brutality. He's Frankenstein's monster. He doesn't know his own strength, and he doesn't understand his own viciousness. He doesn't understand the monster inside of him. He also hurts. You know, he, he whines when he's reprimanded and he's sorry. When you think of the great horror icons out there, I think honestly, Leatherface is the only one I think has some humanity to him because he's a product of his situation. This is not a person that, that, <laughs> that was born this way. This is a person who was built this way. Even though Ed Gain had been adapted in Psycho and in Deranged, Leatherface is unprecedented. You have no idea what he's about, what he wants, why he is the way he is and the film is not going to tell you any of that. I think one of the best things about horror movies is that they're these perfect vehicles for social commentary because I think sometimes when people go to the movies, you know, whether it's intentional or not, like they don't feel, they don't want to go to be preached to, they want to be entertained. You know, what horror does so well, it's a little bit of a Trojan horse. Because it can be viewed a number of different ways. It can be looked at just as a piece of film. It's a horror movie, it's scary. But also be, we feed so much of our own fears into these kinds of things that we can't help but be informed by our surroundings as well. I think horror in general holds a mirror up to society and the best horror shows you exactly what's happening now. You can just kind of like stir the pot a little bit. Like its main objective is to scare you. Its main objective is to fuck you up. And so it's able to just take the temperature of what's going on at the time. At a story level, horror movies have to be quite thin usually. They, 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 you don't have a lot of time to develop complex themes and characters. You, you know, the, the, the audience, walks into the theater and they want to be scared off the bat. They just don't, you know, they want to be scared right away. Um, so usually that puts pressure in the story to just get going. I think Scorsese called it smuggling. Like if you make a genre movie or an exploitation movie, it's so much actually easier to put a message in there than to make a message movie. Because you can't play a message movie at the drive-in. What that does eventually, the less you say, you become that mystery guy on the party having a smoke in the corner, doesn't say anything, and all the girls fall in love with him because they don't know who he is. I think a horror of mash to do that thing where you don't say anything, you just present all these ideas and the audience will just fill it with, you know, and the critics mostly will fill it with like meaning and, and will find its things. You know, I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre is exploring the idea of uh, disenfranchisement. The slaughterhouse has become mechanized. Manual labor is no longer required. I think, I think he's exploring a little bit of those ideas of disenfranchisement and when you know, le left to rot out in the Texas sun, you slowly start going insane without any purpose. Once you, once that lifeline, that job's taken away from you, well, you know, they, they're going to direct that energy somewhere else. Es el sur contra el norte, es el liberal contra el conservador, es lo primitivo contra lo moderno, el campo contra la, te contra la tecnología o la tecnificación, es lo rural contra lo urbano, básicamente es la educación contra la falta de cultura. Filmmakers, even without realizing, inject themes into their movies, even without thinking, they're just talking about that because they just come from you and your experience and your reality and clearly you know, Toby Hooper and Kim Hinkle were going past and going through something in those times that made him talk about those things. You know, they didn't believe in the system anymore either. Like, that's why they put that sign at the beginning that claims this is a true story because they were saying the government is lying to us all the time. Let's lie as well. You know, we were coming out of Vietnam. We were coming out of Watergate. In any organization, 
the man at the top must bear the responsibility. That responsibility, therefore, belongs here, in this office. I accept it. Nobody trusted anything anymore. You know, there was sort of this disillusionment that existed in America in the 1970s. I think that's what, that's what horror can do, and horror is like just a better metric of what's going on at the time than any other genre, because it's the most immediate of all the genres. Growing up half my life as a vegetarian and vegan, off and on, I can't help but see this like vegetarian allegory in the film in that in the beginning of the film Franklin describes how the cattle are killed and all the rest of the kids are like we don't want to hear about that and then they go on to be killed in that exact way and eaten. I believe it was Guillermo del Toro who said like after the first time he had seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre he didn't eat meat for like a year or something like that. And in some ways, I think there, you could even argue that the movie is sort of this statement about vegetarianism and how, you know, where is the, the stuff that we enjoy eating? Like, where does it really come from and what are we doing? And Chainsaw was one of those films where I think when you're the video store kid in the 80s, you're renting everything. But as you rent everything, you're starting to recognize, oh, this is, this is not like these. This is doing something else. This is doing something more. There's a craft happening here. There's a seriousness happening here that, that it maybe isn't happening with Microwave Massacre. No offense to Microwave Massacre. One of the risks, in reality, most incredible that the film has, and that Toby Hooper had to take, is not having music. What's crazy is I never noticed the lack of music in the film until one day I was like studying it and looking up all these film scores and I'm looking up Chainsaw's score and realizing it doesn't really exist. Making a movie without music, it's, it's a massive challenge. I mean, music definitely helps to make things scarier or more suspenseful or help you get invested with the characters and to, to get to know them or fall in love with certain relationships. Hooper realized he didn't need to use musical cues to get his audience to react. And sometimes music can be a distraction. It's trying to feed things into you, like how you should feel, what that moment's trying to present. No music, then everything is up on about, it's all about the image and what's going on, on screen. There is a score, it's just not musical. And Toby is credited with that, but it's a soundtrack of sounds and things that you hear around you and things that are uncomfortable. It's a weird, unconventional music score, but it's so unsettling because it doesn't feel like anything that you can tangibly grab onto as the familiar. There's a discomfort created by the soundtrack, but it's a very intentional soundtrack. I mean, I think the best horror movies, the, the, the music, the music and the sound design work, work hand in hand, and one takes over when the other needs it to. I mean, the sound design in that movie is incredibly complicated, incredibly sophisticated. I mean, just, I don't, again, I don't, I don't know how they did it. He uses a lot of reverb units, like old hardware, you know, echo boxes and things from the 70s uh, where he'll take like cymbals and percussive elements and just delay them, reverb them into almost they become kind of pads and soundscapes onto themselves. And he layers his stuff. So he's got little things spinning and twirling and just just stuff that kind of gets on your nerves and starts to really trouble you. And then, and then he'll have these really low deep uh, bass tones come from, they must come from an early Moog synthesizer or tone generator. I don't know where those sounds come from, but they're incredibly effective, these low drones that sit underneath this soundscape. I think that's why it was like, freaked people out so much because they just felt like they were there because there wasn't the score to make them, you know, feel like they should be feeling one way or another. But I feel like the sound design of the film is maybe 40% of why we love this movie. Sound gets into your brain more than visuals and if you think about it literally like your eardrum is further into your head than your eyes so it really is some of those sounds really do just get it's invasive he easily could have gone to a friend or or to a music library and scored the scares in a very traditional way but it's another reason this film is so groundbreaking modern day jump scares so many of those are dictated by the score of the movie Whereas in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that first moment when Kirk is just going through the house and Leatherface just walks around the corner there, you know, from the back room, there's no stinger. It's just a moment and you're like, oh, holy shit. And that to me is like, I, I get goosebumps thinking about it. That's the power of horror cinema. 
to me right there in that moment. I think if you put a typical horror score over the visuals, you'd, you'd lose so much of the impact. And sound design was not a term that was much used in the 1970s. And this was truly an early case of designing a soundtrack. It's done so mindfully that, like I say, I think if you, if you went out and polled 10 people who say they know this movie, how, what do you think about the music in Texas Chainsaw Massacre? They would answer you. They wouldn't say there's no music in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But ultimately, like, I think Toby was smart because, again, when you're putting a movie out there that says based on true events, you know, however you want to blur those lines, by not using a traditional score, like, that only heightens, you know, what you're trying to do with it. What a cool thing for a young filmmaker to be that ballsy and that strong in their vision of what they were going to tell. It's like when you've got that performance from Marilyn Burns and, and she looks that terrified and it feels that real, like, mu what's music going to do? It is still one of the most disconcerting horror movies you'll ever watch. There's that sequence where Kirk's first killed. That door flies open and Leatherface comes out the door and just clubs the guy straight away. He goes into convulsions and and we're still sort of just paralyzed and shocked that this is happening. There's been a long build up to this moment. When the first character, the one who you believe is going to be the main character, the alpha male, gets hit in the head and dragged away into Leatherface's lair, there's this big, heavy metal gate that he pulls shut. And you have no idea what happens behind it. That to me was iconic, right? The door being slammed in your face, not knowing what's on the other side. And then he cuts outside and she's on the, the swing. And the soundtrack is just giving you this hum. And you know that she's about five minutes from dying at the most. But that slow dread, that, that soaked in sunlight dread of her creeping, walking over to the house to go check it out. Pam getting off the porch swing and walking up to the house, which is so iconic. It's the really low dolly shot of her iconic red shorts. And the film is remembered so much for being so raw and so real feeling, but I don't think that should be mistaken with, like it doesn't you know, look like a documentary. It's not like handheld or anything like that. It's very smooth, like the, the photography is incredibly like pristine. It's just that it feels so raw that like you remember it like it was a documentary, even though it, it shot like you know, an art film. Then she wanders into the house and we're already completely on edge by this point. And then it, amps up by degrees. She finds the bone room. She finds the chicken in the cage and she looks at the furniture and the movie stops down long enough to show you all the stuff finally. And the feathers everywhere and the, and the weird rotting bone furniture and these things hanging from, I mean, it's just, it's so unsettling. And then you're like, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. And when she does, it's too late. She goes out there and then there's Leatherface and he snatches her off the porch very slow, pacing back to the, the meat hook. It's just a powerhouse sequence. You're never going to forget it. Putting a human body, a live squirming body, onto a meat hook, that really gets me, because I'm just like, oh, the spine's there. What's the spine? The escalation of that, from her on the porch unaware to her on the meat hook, watching Leatherface cut up Kirk with a chainsaw, is maybe everything that I love about the film in, in, a, in a one sequence. I look back, I think in my mind there was tons of blood. It was gushing down all over the floor. There's no blood. There is no blood. I dreamt it, and I think, for a scene to make me think it was more gory than it is, it must it, it must be magic. Maybe up to that point in my life, watching horror I don't know that I've ever been quite as scared and distressed as I was in, in those, you know, three or four minutes. I think it speaks to the horror that is Texas Chainsaw Massacre and how Toby mounted it. For whatever reason, the daylight stuff is always more horrifying to me than the nighttime stuff. And so while we're recognizing and respecting the, the arc that the film is on, to me, the best scenes are earlier. The massacre in Texas has a very fragment before that these people, that all the kids come to the house and that there is all this catastrophe, all this catastrophe. And it's when, with a simple movement of the camera, we pass behind a tree in which we see a clock. And this clock is perforated with a point. And basically, what does that mean? A small detail that is telling us the destiny of the story. Because the time of these characters has finished. I think as soon as you get Sally and Franklin in that forest and they start heading towards the house, that's when the film sort of changes modes to a degree. What I like is that everything in the village is related to the end. 
y esto creó en realidad un tropo dentro del cine de género posterior, en lo que todo se junta al final. Se junta la familia y comprendemos el modus operandi precisamente de todo esta de toda esta familia. You don't really know that the guy at the gas station is involved with it. You know, maybe you sort of suspect that the hitchhiker might have something to do with it, but you don't really know that there's this whole family and this whole kind of institution that exists where these people are, are have all these plans on how they're going to kill people who come through. And it's so significant because you kind of know. You know, but you don't know. And then when he comes in with the bag and the stick, you're like, oh, she's out of the frying pan and into the fire. If you sit somebody down and just show them the last reel of this movie, they'll go mad. <laughs> it is just such a bombardment. When I watch that third act, for me, I, I always feel like that I can connect with the exhaust, you know, how exhausted the main character is. That final sequence in Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, at, the, at the dinner table is truly nightmarish and deeply distressing. I think it's that sense of hopelessness and you're the only one sitting at the table that kind of makes sense of it, that, that you become the weird one when normal is insanity because in that table the whole family is in that insane space and, and, and the only character that you will feel connected to feels like the crazy person, right? So that you know, is the world upside down. It's like everything that is that you know that makes no sense not only uh, you know making sense for the met for the crazies when granddad they're making him take a swing at the back of her head it's basically just a, a a wide shot of of her head being held down in the barrel and the hammer you know whizzing past her ear and being picked up again and then it kind of kind of clips her on the corner of the head and it feels like a real hammer it feels like it's got weight all i kept thinking is oh my god that poor actress because that feels like a real hammer and dear god how many times did they hit her in the head it feels like they're really just throwing this hammer around next to this actress's head and how do you fucking fake that it's like there's something that feels so scuzzy and dangerous and snuffy about about that moment and also just the kind of the ridiculousness of it and the kind of um the humiliation of it and the um you know when you're whenever you're whenever you're making horror you know especially the kind of horror that i make which is a bit a bit more a bit more fun and a bit more kind of um like you want to you want you're kind of playing a trick on, on the audience it's almost the opposite you're trying to hide a mechanism and in that scene there's almost no mechanism there at all you know it just looks like a real actress a real hammer it feels so unlike a movie that moment and the nature of what they were shooting you know bashing her over the head she's screaming constantly it must have been just exhausting physically and mentally so uh, I think that's why that sequence is so effective because you're seeing that the actor's misery projected up there on the screen for all time and it's uh, it's fully authentic I don't know how much acting was involved in that the amount of suspense in that moment there's just no, nothing close I mean I I've always tried to do that in my films in Don't Breed, we really try to milk the limits of suspense of how suspenseful can something be without becoming silly and um, and I think it's impossible to match the level of suspense that the that dinner scene has. You know, that particularly that moment of Grandpa trying to hit her in the head. You know it's coming, but he's weak. But eventually he might do it, and she's helpless, and and it's so horrendous. And and there's a sense of morality from the crazy characters trying to honor Grandpa by giving him the kill because he used to be the best at killing people in the slaughterhouse. And it's so convincing. And I think a big part of that reason is because. Uh, the nature of how the, the, the sequence was shot, but what, what those actors and crew members endured during that. They had no money, so they were shooting seven days a week. You know, it was often at least 90 degrees during their shoot. Nobody could change clothing because they didn't have budgets for, for extra clothing. And I remember once talking to Gunnar Hansen for an interview and he was saying like how he didn't even want to be like within a mile of himself by near the, the end of that shoot because he smelled so terribly. And there was nothing they could do. There was no fix. There was no cologne, nothing that they could do to make him smell any better. They did two master shots. So Hooper wanted a master from, from Marilyn Burns' point of view and he wanted a master shot from Grandpa's point of view. So it's a six minute sequence. He also then needed inserts and he insisted on the inserts being part of another long continuous take. So that's a six minute thing they're doing over and over again. If you calculate like three takes per you know angle, provided the actors get it right and there's no technical screw-ups. That's still around 25, 30 takes of a six-minute sequence. That's brutal. 
So no wonder those performances are so unhinged. No wonder they all look genuinely crazy and Marilyn looks so genuinely traumatized. They've, you know, almost put it in real time, like, which makes that dread so real. It's like you're sitting at the table with Sally and it's just like, will this please end? Like the constant cuts to her eyes and close up. Everything is right in your face and there's nowhere to run if you're an audience member. There's just stuff in every corner and Sally doesn't know where to look. And then we're looking through her perspective. We don't know where to look. We don't know what's gonna happen. And it really brings us into the actual terror that she's feeling. And it's amazing. And it just carries us through the last third of the film. That last act is loud. There's nothing but screaming and chainsaws on the soundtrack. And it's, it's disturbing. You know, it really makes you uncomfortable. The sound design really goes crazy in that the dinner table scene with the horrible sounds that are getting into your head. Every noise and every sound is so specific and so sought through and so effective. There's nothing in this film that takes you out of that moment. The film is paroxytic, that means that it's like that, it's not a mountain russe, it's just a mountain that goes up, goes up, goes up, and that's going to reach a point culminant where the folly triumphs. There's no way to breathe watching that moment, just wait and see what, what's going to happen. So still till today, when I watch it, I feel like I don't know if she's going to die or not in that moment, even if I've seen the movie a million times. You really fear that she could die in this movie because there are no rules. If you're seeing a movie from Universal or 20th Century Fox, the hero is going to live. You're not so sure when it's from Bryanston. You know, that scene is insanity. And so when she finally breaks free, like you can feel her, like it's so visceral, you can feel her, like her madness. And she gets out and it's, it's sunny out, it's, it's daytime. And you kind of realize how in it you've been. Like you've just kind of forgotten the outside world. Uh, it's a really spectacular moment. It is almost like she wakes up from a dream. And as she runs, I can feel her, how exhausted she is. And, and, and I feel like she's gonna trip any moment and th that's it, there's no way she can keep running at that pace. Is there something about that that just, when it's, it, because it, and it's, it's definitely on her performance that you can really believe that she, she cannot do it anymore and she's gonna collapse any moment. So when she really makes it and jumps into the back of that pickup truck and, and the, the chainsaw is like swim, swinging right on her face and she managed to make it, that's what do you aim for on every climax for a horror movie as a filmmaker, You're trying to reach that sense of desperation, but also that you punish the audience so much during the movie that the audience knows you mean business and, and that you might even kill this character, right? If Sally dies on that last run, no one would have been surprised. That would have been, you know, that what would have make sense on the on you know how, you know based on how brutal the movie was. So that that is usually a great ending, something where it could go either way, and the movie is it's not fucking around and it could definitely kill this character if they want to. And so that's why you when when you're truly scared. Some of the movies may be based on the tone and everything. You know that that character is going to survive. And, and Texas Chainsaw and all the other, and the, the really true horror classics, in, in the last few minutes, you know that anything goes and anything can happen. In the 1970s, critics hated horror movies. No horror movies got good reviews. They were the bane of civilization. By Hollywood standards, a horror movie is one step down from a porno flick. Horror was rude. It's intentionally rude, and it's not made for the mainstream. A good horror movie usually is a big fuck you to society. So film critics, they're part of the establishment, they're part of the industry, they're part of the business. Great horror movies, they come in and just spit on the face of the whole business. So how, there's no way the business is gonna take it kindly and goes like, yeah, great film. They're just gonna go like, nah, this is unnecessarily, and we don't want this. There needs to be a learning curve before the rest of the world gets on board with what something achieved. And that goes back to Dracula, that goes back to Freaks. That's always been the case. You know, horror, horror has been a ghetto for, you know, so long in terms of, critical respect. I think one of the reasons that a lot of critics at the time might have bumped on it and that, you know, there's that, there's that quote from Ebert where he says this is an unnecessary movie, is that I think the primary function of this movie is it, it, want, it wants to make you feel before it wants to make you think. But I think what's interesting when you look at film critics of yesteryear, and I love Roger Ebert, even though the fact that, like, I never agreed with him on horror movies, I think maybe five times I could count on my hand, like, 
that I was like, okay, he gets it. Like there's, he was never kind to horror movies. And honestly, that's okay. It makes me a little sad that he didn't understand sort of the craftsmanship that went into these things and would immediately sort of dismiss them on the surface level. I think it's the fate of movies like this to not get recognized out of the gate. That as an audience or as a culture, we have to sit with them for a little while. They simply wouldn't have ever seen anything like this before. This would have come like a bolt out of the blue. This absolutely unhinged, deranged movie. They would have had no frame of reference for seeing anything like this before. So um, I have no doubt that it upset a lot of critics and probably deeply traumatized a lot of critics. Son estudiosos, pero precisamente los estudios se basan en algo ya conocido, en lo que ya está ampliado y de cierta forma en lo que ya, en lo que ya fue creado. Pero qué pasa cuando algo que no se conoce llega transgrediendo las reglas? El crítico de cine en realidad no sabe qué está viendo porque no está preparado en un principio. This movie makes you feel awful. You know, it makes it makes you want to have a shower afterwards. And how do you how do you justify that? But it's totally valid as an artistic statement. It's you know, it's one of the um, it's one of the greatest things that cinema can do. There was not a horror critical community at that time who could appreciate that. To this day, we don't know how much money this movie actually made because of Bryanson. So you'd think if you're not gonna make money, at least they can get some recognition out of the deal. But they, they were denied that as well. You know, there there's a sense of elitism there. They were like, oh, another horror movie. And they sat down and they refused to take the film at face value. We don't know how much of a legacy something's gonna have until obviously way after. And maybe people just thought it was a throwaway film. It was just a drive for drive-in theaters. I remember being a kid in the 80s. And even at that point, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was still sort of seen as this grimy, grindhouse -y type movie. Some of the actresses had a hard time finding work just by association with this movie shortly after. Terry McMinn famously didn't want to have anything to do with this movie for a number of years, and probably only around the 40th anniversary you start to see her turn up at conventions and, and be open to hearing what this film meant to people. Gunnar Hansen had a very sort of difficult relationship with it, with it as well. And I don't know if that would have been changed if, you know, someone like Roger Ebert recognized the film for what it was at the time. Critics get things wrong all the time. They're only human and you can't blame them at the time because it's their opinion. Hindsight's always going to be 2020, and that is so true in the world of film criticism. Like, you know, we don't know what we're doing. We're just out there reacting to stuff. And if you're going to like it, you're going to like it. And if you're not, you're not. It's a confrontational movie. And uh, I think that these are very emotional responses in that initial wave of, of critiques. And that's what happens. It's not until much later when you've calmed down, you maybe reappraised and rewatched to see what it's saying that you're like, yes, this is a classic. Part of the reason horror movies are embraced by young people is because they are renegade cinema. These are movies you don't want your parents to embrace. You know, just like heavy metal music or whatever. You, you want something that's yours and is not polite. And I, I think that's one reason that, that people, when they see a horror film that sticks with them when they're young, it stays with them for the rest of their lives. It accomplishes everything it sets out to do with brilliance and unparalleled terror. It's a challenge for every filmmaker who's made a really successful first film to come up with their sophomore movie. Particularly with something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it was so original and so incredibly intense and unlike anything else and it's just so effective. He made a classic film and this often happens with people who make a classic film in the beginning of their career. How do you follow up with that? When you make that film, what's your follow-up going to be? Like, what do you do for a second act, right? And the idea of sophomore jinx, every good filmmaker has got one great film in them. No matter what, there's one great masterpiece. If you're blessed or tremendously talented or the fates look after you in the right way, maybe you have two or three masterpieces. The problem is, Toby grew up in a period of time that produced Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, you know, Hal Ashby, amazing filmmakers who kept having these incredible moments in film, right? You know, after the success of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I think honestly, and I say this with, with total love, I think Toby Hooper was often his own worst enemy. But also when you're an independent filmmaker out of Austin, Texas, your dream is to go to Hollywood and make movies. You don't think about the compromise that goes into that. So he does this remarkable thing, but here's this guy 
who's, you know, in town, in Texas. He's not in LA. He's not a wheeler dealer. He's not a guy from New York. He doesn't have a silver spoon. He didn't go to the best film school. It's none of that kind of connective tissue, right? He was so anti-studio. And he was a wild, like he just wanted to go out and make these crazy wild movies. You know, Eaten Alive was an attempt to recapture what happened to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it's not the same thing. And it was a job. It was not something that he'd originated himself. What's really interesting about where Hooper went after the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is that he ended up doing television. It's not as long of a time period as you might think between Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the Salem's Lot miniseries, which I remember as being event television. And it wasn't some cheapy anything. It was like a big deal when that was happening. And that was maybe his first big swing. He'd done Eaten Alive, which, you know, he at least got to make Eaten Alive in, in Hollywood. Salem's Lot was like, felt like a, his toe in the water for a bigger world. And then you're only four years away from Poltergeist at that point. William Friedkin was the first Hollywood filmmaker to discover him with Chainsaw and try to open doors for him to make movies at Universal. And he'd done The Fun House and he'd done some other things and I think he got kicked off the dark. That relationship didn't pan out and you know he wasn't really making Hollywood movies until Poltergeist. And then everybody tried to give credit to Steven Spielberg on Poltergeist when the credit is equally shared. I was on the set when that film was being made. I saw Steven sitting on the, uh, the dolly and behind the camera and saying we can push into a two shot here and I saw Toby calling action and cut and I saw Toby doing the pre-production that is so important to a director's job in a movie. There's the controversy about Poltergeist but I think that that's a lot of journalists who don't understand how film sets work, frankly. The people who were there, who I give any credence to, maintain that he directed the film. And Stephen gave him a platform to be able to be a part of the Hollywood machine that makes big, successful, polished movies. Hollywood loves to reward success with all kinds of excess. They shove all kinds of deals at you because they just want you to make the same widget again, but for a little more money so they can make it sparkly, right? And cast better looking people and all that. And I think that those temptations are disastrous for any filmmaker. Toby's career is bumpy in a way that I'm not sure I'm ready to explain, but I, I do think that he got a reputation very soon whether that was good or bad. And I think if you look at the 18 month period where he made Chainsaw 2, Invaders from Mars, Life Force, three wildly different films. And I think he doesn't get enough credit for being kind of uh, malleable. He took these big fucking swings and that's like, that's how you, that's how you end up with, you know, with an iconic film like like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you take, you take big swings. Any movie maker wants the ability to not worry about where the money is coming from, how many days you can shoot. If you can keep production going, you don't think about how hard it is to live in Hollywood and try to be a part of that machine where it's all based on big hit movies. An independent movie can go, could go out there and do modestly well you know, make $3 million uh, on a, on a $100,000 investment, and that's a big success. You make a $3 million box office gross on a Hollywood movie, you may never work again. So it, it, it was a complicated place to be. But I've seen even friends who, who get a hit, and they get a lot of people talking in their ears and a lot of people shoving candy under their noses. And that's, that happens, it just happens. I think all of these guys, the, the masters of horror, I think they all became collectively known as, all had their own individual arcs. And some of them peaked early, some of them never stopped, some of them kind of went where the wind took them. And I'm not sure what Mr. Hooper's total deal was, but he seemed down for anything. You want to be able to make a good living, making good movies and that sort of thing. I don't think he fought that. I think he embraced it. I think he felt that he could make Toby Hooper movies in Hollywood. And that was a tough thing for him to do. You know, he, he did it and he didn't do it. 
You know, when you make movies for Canon in Hollywood, it's not like making movies for MGM in Hollywood. And I think he discovered that to his dismay. Do I bemoan the fact that any of that happened? Because I think we lost, we lost some great movies from Toby, like things that he could have made that I wish he had been given the opportunity to make, yes. I always want to appreciate people, you know, when they're here. And, but now that to Toby is gone, like, there's been such a new appreciation for his career. But I feel like he was always sort of under, undervalued, I think, in his day. Toby Hooper's career is one of those greatest what ifs, where you're like, what if, you know, what if, what if they had set out to do a Texas Chainsaw, you know, sequel just a few years later, even before the sort of phenomenon of, you know, horror sequels. It makes me a little sad because, again, I think he's somebody who had such great skill and never quite got the the due that he was, he should have been given while he was here. The Toby that I knew was gentle and lovely and soft-spoken and very kind. Um, and an amazing guy. So it's amazing that he was able to come through whatever hell and whatever demons he had to battle. And by the way, we all battle them. Like we all have our demons, whatever that happens to be, whether it's, you know, substance or whether it's bad marriages or, um, or taking ourselves too seriously or the terror of being an imposter, which every filmmaker goes through that. Um, Toby was no imposter. Toby was the real deal. For a couple years, it would be hard for me to even say Toby's name or speak about him without tearing up. You know, he, uh, he was a great guy and a good friend, and I'm doing it now. It's painful. He should still be around. And the circumstances that he was under for the last couple of years of his life led to an early demise that never should have happened. We're almost 50 years removed from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, you know, we've had countless sequels, we've had remakes, we've had prequels. Nothing's ever gonna touch it. I think because of the fact that it was such a lightning in a bottle project, because they weren't overthinking it. They were in the moment, they were just running and gunning it, like to make this movie the best that they could with the resources that they had. But they definitely don't make them like that anymore. They, you know, no one had a great time making that film. You know, like Toby Hoover said, like everybody hated me by the end of the, of the film, which is a sentiment I can definitely subscribe to, but it has happened to me as well. And not to say that it's the right way, but like, you know, you've got people, you know, people looking out for actors and things like that. Everything feels a little safer these days. Nothing about Texas Chainsaw Massacre feels safe. Like, this is probably the least safe horror movie you're gonna get. But they all do it for the sake of love of film, and, and that's what you can see of that film, that everybody is committed to tell that story and work crazy hours and from Monday to Sunday. And that translates into the film, the, the, the true exhaustion, that there, there's real blood in the screen, that, you, that they cut his thumb for real just because blood wasn't pumping through the rig. So all the things that, that don't really happen anymore these days, they made made for a, you know, timeless classic, I think. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is always going to be relevant and it's always going to be something that really blows people away because it's it's still, after 50 years, very, very unique. No matter how many times I rewatch this movie, I can pick up something new every time. When a movie's a classic, it's a classic. And we will be talking about it 100 years from now. It broke ground. It was unique and different and there are certain iconic things the exorcist rosemary's baby there's psycho there are certain horror films that just stay in the psyche for years and years and years texas chainsaw is absolutely one of those i think people don't understand with those kind of low budget regional films it really boils down to the people involved in the film all of them the film crew the cast giving 100% and then some to make the film work. And they have to be committed to everything that they're doing and they have to do more. And the fact that he was able to pull together such a beautifully artistic and terrifying film with this group of people who were kind of new uh, is a really amazing aspect of the film. And every time I watch it, I'm just really impressed with the passion behind it. We're talking about the birth of independent film where you or I could go out, get a van with a bunch of you know, film school students and shoot a movie that makes more money than Studio Fair. That was new. I think 50 years on with all different trends and styles of horror film that have come, there it's still a unicorn. 
there's still nothing like that film. It feels like a legitimate broadcast of madness. And that's what that movie to me is about more than anything, that feeling that the madness in the world, you could be caught up in it and victimized by it at any time. That's fucking scary. It feels unsafe and it feels authentic in a way that few other films do. No matter how more polished our techniques get or our, our production design, how, how, much, how much more ass we can put into a movie, there's, there's just never in horror, in my opinion, been something that approaches the, the sort of matter of fact reality of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I think in a lot of ways, when you start to overproduce something, I think that's when you start to lose the magic. And I think that's when that sort of, that disconnect comes up because that's the one great thing about Texas Chainsaw is because it isn't so overly produced you feel like you're in the middle of it. There are films that have that budget and had that equipment that didn't get that result, right? Just being cheap isn't enough. Just being extreme isn't enough. Just being uh, chaotic isn't enough. It, it's a perfect blend of resources and limitations and subject matter that has not been equaled, in my opinion, in 50 years. I say this as a huge fan of something like Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, but there is a little bit of a disconnect because it's a little glossier. It's got a bigger budget. It's got a lot more going on. And it's obviously batshit crazy. Even now, just saying the words Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it invokes something in me. And it invokes something in people all across the world. It means something. And that's why they keep doing the sequels, because the Texas Chainsaw Massacre means something to people. It's classic in the same way that classic literature never goes away. I think we just picked up that. We reference books because they seem such so much more a time-honored thing. And film only being, you know, past its centennial, we still don't see it as this document. But they are documents and they are no different than great literature. When I look, you boys don't want to go mess around the whole house. It's a new way people put on a job. It looks like there must have been a nursery room. You no, know, we should have asked him if there was another gas station room. Let's just go back now. Do you think I said something made him mad? I'm not leaving you without Jerry. One picture's worth a thousand words, so how many words is a movie worth?